Hey, White Sox fans, it's Brett Ballantini hosting again. It's every night at this point. Southside Sox Mothership Podcast 55. And let me tell you, we got some stuff to celebrate. I am not a drinker. I don't know how to drink. Family history, hat tip pops, shout out to this, but I've got my ch- Chococo. If it's good enough for the Virgin Islands, it's good enough for me. So I'll be tipping tonight. <laughs> Uh, listen, we are celebrating uh, a terrific trade deadline for the White Sox, um, capped by somehow pulling Craig Kimbrell <laughs> out of the hat, throwing him down the chimney, and sitting him right under the tree for White Sox fans, uh, something that just a night ago we thought was not possible. Who knew that the Cubs would look at Nick Madrigal as a top 100 uh, talent, as if he was still a prospect? But I guess uh, initially, let's go around. Reactions to what seems like a pretty marvelous trade deadline for the White Sox. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, every hole that we thought of, they added something to that. There's a new starting second baseman. Uh, there's another guy besides Kopech that you can lo- use in later innings that's not Hendricks. And then they added, uh, I don't know, the best closer of our generation. <laughs> so, and he's doing pretty well, like a 0.5 ERA, which, I think that's pretty good. So I think they did awesome. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> to Darren Black, because he's always here. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I would just piggyback off that. They did great. I, as a Nick Magical lover, was a little sad, but I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, Tyrone actually had shared something wonderful that I was like, this actually makes me feel a little bit better because they were talking about how he is kind of replaceable, even if he's great. But um, yeah, I think all of those acquisitions were great. The only thing that would have been nicer was Chris Bryant, if he could do right field, but you know, that's fine. It's whatever. (laughs) It is whatever. And oh my goodness. Yeah. How much different could our feelings be now versus two days ago. Like a lot has changed, of course, in that time. Um, Yeah, and they waited for a pretty long time, but they got it done nonetheless, and that's what matters. And even though I'm also a little bit on the higher side um, compared to the average person on Nick Madrigal, this is still a trade that I would make 10 times out of 10. Like I thought about this very carefully today and Although I also am a little bit sad to see him go and I wish him luck in the future. This is a good trade. They get Campbell, not just for the end of this year, but through the end of next season. And he's just been phenomenal this year and he will provide a ton of help to the bullpen and yeah, much credit to the front office for fixing the gaps that we had, had identified. I apologize, uh, Super Joseph. I did not send the condolence card. I was too busy celebrating with Tommy Barbie, the uh, the con- the continuing holding on to for whatever reason, Mike Rodolfo, to actually send you condolences for uh, for losing Nick Madrigal, and I guess also to the uh, to the other half of the Indianapolis field office, uh, Crystal. Uh, but I'm glad you two have a good sense of of what that's all about and what the White Sox needed to do. Uh, Tyrone, I would suspect that you are uh, also pleased with how things have transpired. Yeah, I think for me, I like, I really just wanted like evidence that like Rick Hahn was watching the same games I was watching and like would address the holes that felt obvious. So like the first trade of, you know, the first day of getting, you know, Cesar Hernandez and Ryan Tavera, I was like, okay, he he saw the holes. And then I think the getting Craig Kimbrell, just like that's a, we have a chance to win the world series. So we're going to go out and try to do it. And, that's a like a big trade and I've never been super high on Madrigal and I think it's just I'm biased against players that don't hit home runs like it's just I'm so I think for me it was always one of the things where it, losing Madrigal to me is like we can we'll find someone else right. like I'm not too upset over it but I I get why others see value in him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys can tell that I'm not non-experienced drinker. I neglected to even introduce you all. So of course we have the Indianapolis field office in its entirety. That's Super Joseph Reese's. Crystal O'Keefe. Sometimes she's just, well, you know, sometimes I just like to call her Colleen or something else. I don't, I will not do that in this podcast, no matter how much 
Chococo, I imbibe. Uh, Tyrone Palmer, who's hopped on for several fours, including some of our trade deadline ones. And again, <laughs> Darren, Darren Black, he's actually Darren. He's in the other room. <laughs> you didn't know. Yeah. He's my roommate. I just tap hey, on the Brett. shoulder and say, hey, Darren, it's time. <laughs> hey, Darren, what's up? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing I thought was notable with Nick Madrigal is, uh, I think it's important to point out, he's been he's had a significant injury now for three straight years. He cannot play a full season. It doesn't mean he won't play 15 straight years, 162 games, and challenge Lou Gehrig uh, and Cal Ripken. Uh, but I think that had to be a flag for the White Sox. And I think we even had a tell perhaps even last year when there was a lot of talk about, hey, let's get him one of those cheap extensions. You know, let's lock him up, you know, half the price of Robert. But, uh, you know, let's throw that out there. Or let's, let's even talk about it. No talk about it. So I think they really had a wait and see attitude with Madrigal. And again, when he got hurt, a fluke injury or not, well, okay, that's maybe three in a row. Three in a row isn't so good. Uh, it seems like a gamble that was worth making. Uh, I guess we've alluded a little bit to how the White Sox have done overall. Of course, not every single thing, as Darren said, was was patched. We still have a catcher situation that's a little confusing, although I guess Sebi Zavala is at least defensively going to be able to hold it down until Yasmani comes. Do we walk away from the trade deadline still, deadline still wishing there was something more, or is this a little bit more than we thought we'd be able to do? Uh, well, uh, well, you can just listen to the past podcast. No, I did not expect to get a prime bullpen arm. Um, I mean, I, I would have, I mean, there's a lot of players I would have uh, liked besides Cesar Hernandez, but he's still better than what they had. So awesome. And then I, I, Ryan Tapera was one of the guys that I would have really wanted. Um, Cause just thinking about how the Sox used to work at t- trade deadlines, like not really trade from their major league roster, though it, it does say how bad their farm system is that they had to go do that instead of trade someone from their farm, um, which is another topic for another time, I guess. But um, I like very surprised and like happily surprised throughout these past couple of days. Let me jump in and, and, and ch- change the direction a little bit. Sorry to interrupt, but I, I guess in addition to this, this, does this make the White Sox clear AL favorites at this point? Clear favorites? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I would say no to the clear AL favorite. It, it's close. I, it, it's a little bit too close for, for me to make that claim right now. Um, I am not intimidated by any particular American League opponents. Were they like, were they to draw any of them in particular? Um, like none of them scare me that much assuming the White Sox are healthy come October um but yeah that absolutely brings them closer to being to that step um it's very very close to in my opinion at the top of the American League right now I think if like you could guarantee health and like you knew that like Eloy and Robert and Grandal were all at a hundred percent then I would say I think they're clear favorites I think Without that, I think it, it's much closer, and I think like teams like Houston still worry me. So no one wants to hop on the train. Say clear. Obviously, on paper, I would say on paper are they favored? So yeah, I guess we would assume return to health, uh, et cetera. So okay, Tyrone, he's just about on the uh, on the tram with me. Okay, I'm just gonna uh, get all the way on. I'm, I'm all right, yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, just you know, World Series or bust. Let's go. All right, <laughs> just lose it like I have. <laughs> I would be fully on that train if our division just didn't suck. And that's why we were clearly like what nine games up or whatever. No, I don't think we're that much, but still if our division wasn't complete and total garbage, I would say hell yes. But if we struggle against the Astros, then I'm going to say we're up there. That's a very good self-hating White Sox fan answer there, Chris. They're like, man, there's got to be a reason. I can't believe this. Oh, yeah, it's because the division sucks. And it does. There's no doubt about that. You're not wrong. Yeah. Well, we all just saw that Moncada homer. So, yeah, I think that kind of <laughs> that kind of explains that. The old, uh, the old double Conseco. You've got to love seeing that. You've got to love seeing that. Um, all right, well, let's take a quick break so we don't forget to do it because believe me, I'm probably going to forget some things before this is done. Uh, we'll be right back with the rest of our Mothership podcast, number 55. Hey, this is Brett Ballantini. I forgot to introduce everybody, but I ended up doing it, so take it easy. Welcome back from the break. It is Southside Sox Mothership podcast, number 55. It is the trade deadline celebration podcast. We honestly didn't think we were going to have. We thought maybe yesterday was 
you know, we sort of popped all of, you know, we, 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 all the party favors, we have none left because we thought we we're going to just blow them all yesterday. And this is going to be a very quiet day. And we have a podcast today talking about what other teams did. And there is stuff to talk about with other teams, but let's not get to that quite yet. Um, I guess we sort of crept up on it a little bit here about this whole favorites thing that a, a couple of you were reluctant to hop on for. But uh, I do want to know this, and I think I already presented this question to you. Can we run out? Do we need to run out the major league team the rest of the year? Can we run out the Charlotte Knights or can we run out the Birmingham Barons and win this division, given the fact that the AL Central has somehow gotten weaker? Yeah, so, I mean... Uh, no, I mean, short answer, no, but um, if we want to have fun with it, I mean, yeah, I, I appreciate that you're it, trying to answer the question. I, I think if I think the Charlotte outfield might be better than the rest of the AL Central's outfield, like a, a, like a legitimate like thing with Luis Gonzalez, Blake Rutherford, Mike Rodolfo, that might be better, especially with Cleveland's trades today. I think that might actually be. Yeah, Darren, let me just ask you directly, because you're our, you're, you know, you're one of our prospects guys. Are you confident that the Charlotte Knights outfield would not head a ball uh, over the fence uh, while trying to catch it? Um, uh, uh, Yeah, I'm confident that they, they would not do that. I'm pretty, like, Miker doesn't move that quick. He's known for his arm. And then the other two are pretty sound defenders. So I don't, I mean... Now, if we talk about the infield, that's a different story. That's a bit, that's a bit more fun. The but. expert miners analysis of Darren Black, ladies and gentlemen, thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, okay, again, uh, let me throw it out to the rest of you in terms of this AL Central. Can we just play backwards? Can we play five innings? Uh, it does seem like it is in the bag. And of course, you don't want to monkey around with it and, 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 and goof your way to the finish line. Of course, of course, they're going to run everything out there. But I mean, at this point, point is... The division somehow did get worse, clearly worse. I mean, I will say as far as like goofing around, I mean, I think that was kind of how they set the lineup yesterday, <laughs> where just everyone gets to play wherever they want. <laughs> you know, and I, I, I would feel more confident about like, we could just run out our, our double A team if like the Sox hadn't just lost three out of four to the Royals. You know, I feel like post all-star break, it's kind of, it's, it's not been great. Although to be fair, I mean they haven't really lost much ground because everyone else is terrible. So, and that but was I, Kansas I, City's playoff series. Let's face it, that was that was their playoffs this year. So, congratulations, Kansas City, you won the July playoffs. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on from the rest of the AL Central division because it's depressing. Who wants to talk about this crap division? I mean, they were bad to begin with and they got worse. I mean, Detroit sort of didn't. So, you know, they're, high, they're, they're like, hey, we got three. We've had the we've had three winning months in a row. That means we're good now. I guess I guess you can't sleep on Detroit. I, that's ridiculous. Uh, let's take it a little broader to baseball in general. Obviously, the Cubs completely gut their team. Washington Nationals gut their team. So they're managing to send coronavirus throughout the country now. Uh, what did we think? What jumped out at you as maybe the most surprising move or something you completely expected? I expected the Cubs to just have a fire sale once they started releasing pretty good players. I've had a lot of friends that have reached out that are saying, I need a new team to cheer for. So I was like, well, I mean, just you have an answer. Me. We're a welcoming community. Um, but the whole, like, oh, that whole big six trade, six people uh, trade deal, I came and talked tonight. That was pretty wild to watch go down. And um, good for them to get Max because I wanted Max to take place of Dallas Keuchel. <laughs> That that, uh, that Mike Rizzo is is sneaky, man. Do not turn your back on Mike Rizzo. He's gonna he's gonna handshake a deal, and then he's gonna he's gonna shop at the twenty. He's gonna shop at the twenty eight other. Uh, that guy's rough, but I guess he got he, he got a better deal from the Dodgers. So you know what do I care? I just hope they just beat the hell out of each other on the West Coast. Who cares? We'll just see him in the World Series, right? Because you're on the tram with me. Uh, okay, what else uh, jumped out uh, to you guys? Um, Anything surprised where guys went or didn't go? There was 
a smaller trade that kind of surprised me earlier, which was when the Twins traded Jay Happ for John Gant and a minor league pitcher who probably doesn't have that much of a future is kind of a marginal prospect. Um, so it was largely a Happ for Gant trade. Um, those two teams probably aren't making well. The, the Cardinal or the Twins definitely aren't making any noise this year. The Cardinals most likely aren't either. Um, just seemed. Like Haps just seemed like a very odd like piece to include with him being um, pretty much out of good Major League Baseball in in his career. Um, he's having a really tough year, so I was just surprised to see him included as you know someone who um, anyone would want in a trade right now. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to be proven wrong about him because I thought he would be a he'd had another decent year in him and that he would be like a pretty good like number four starter for the twins this year but yeah it certainly hasn't been the case um so that one surprised me a bit yeah the Twinkie Town uh account on Twitter and twins fans in general are pretty feisty and uh you may have noted that when uh they Twinkie Town was so excited about their 2023 team how it was shaping up uh, of course I had to respond well okay we'll we'll see you then I, I'm not sure why you're supposed to celebrate like sleeping through the next few seasons and of course we've been through it i think most of us went kicking and screaming i guess maybe some people are like rebuild her maybe darren was like yeah rebuild because it's, it's sort of like a little bit more my thing i hate that crap and i'm so glad it's over and it was so nice to hear rick Hahn say we prioritize now we clearly made a uh, made now a priority because i he's never said that and i'm not sure how long it's been since the white Sox have said that i guess kenny williams falls out of bed thinking that way but uh it was just refreshing not that we needed that confirmation after he pulls off the kimball trade but uh uh the twins seem to do pretty good in their deals is there a team that jumped out at you in terms of the sellers given they're like everybody was uh who maybe stood out as having done the best because it still seemed like it was a seller's market not for rick Hahn, but for everybody else it seemed like it was a seller's market yeah uh, I mean that Barrios deal. I mean that was yeah. that was a lot of that was a lot of prospects uh, capital coming back. But I mean it kind of it kind of has to be the Cubs. I mean just because they traded uh, so much and then they got back like actual we can Madrigal and Hoyer is coming there, um, and then the Yankees guys that they got are actually like top ten like Yankee prospect guys and they were training like their prospects all over the place. Yeah. Um, so people obviously really love them. Um, yeah, probably, probably the Cubs did the best. Um, I, I was really wondering what the Rockies were doing cause they did nothing, but they had to, I, they don't have a GM. Cause I thought the Rockies could have traded a lot with Herman Marquez, John Gray and Trevor story, but <laughs> didn't the team actually send out a they tweet didn't like, do at anything like and the Cubs took advantage of that. Yeah. I think they sent a tweet out today that just said something like, you know, like well into the trade lines and like, you know, like good afternoon or hello, like just opening themselves up for people to say, what have you been doing? Why are you asleep? You're the Colorado Rockies. You're not winning anything this year, but. That legalized marijuana. They just <laughs> woke up. Also, I saw that Anthony Rizzo already hit like a massive bomb tonight in a Yankees uniform. It's like 486 feet. Yeah, it's, it's not like Wrigley is 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 not uh, somewhat of a bandbox, of course, depending on how the wind is blowing. But I think Anthony Rizzo is going to enjoy the fact that he can just sneeze a fly ball out about 200 feet and it's a home run. I think that might he might like that. He might like that. It was nice to see him. I am not in any way an Anthony Rizzo fan, but it was nice to see his batting gloves tonight. The Chicago flag, that was sort of cool. Nice hat tip. Way to go, Anthony. Still don't really like you, but way to go. Too much cubby stink. Uh, well, what else we got to talk about? Should we get back to Madrigal? I mean, is this going to be something that is going to hurt the White Sox? We've got Cesar, Cesar Hernandez for next season as well. Obviously, that's a, a, an option that is very likely to be picked up given this trade. Uh, other players coming in through the pipeline, maybe uh, Jose Rodriguez isn't ready to join the major. But the White Sox have plenty of time to somehow account for that. Not that they usually do in the offseason. Uh, we just got to focus, Rick Hahn, on trades. He seems to be really good at trades. Signing guys... He's a little more fearful or things just happen to always go wrong at the last minute. But uh, is that a gap that's going to be an issue? Cody Hoyer, I, I, it's a reliever. I mean, how, how uptight are you going to get about Cody Hoyer? But is Nick Madrigal something that we, we do have a legit fear uh, could haunt? Or is his cap as a player demonstrated now to be low enough that it's like, 
okay, so maybe we traded Scott Fletcher. He's going to win the batting title next season. <laughs> I'm just going to call it now. <laughs> no, he won't. Although I'm. <laughs> <laughs> We're not quoting you. <laughs> I, yeah, you, you are aware I'm, I'm a magical fan, but um, I will, I, even I will have to admit, like part of the reason I was as excited as I was for him as he was coming up through the minor leagues was because of the perception that, you know, his fielding tool was a, an yeah. elite tool of his. And it just hasn't been there. We've seen like, brief moments where it's been there but for the most part um it's been for them like when you take the good with the bad that we've seen of him it's been pretty disappointing i would say just with how high the expectations were it's been largely an average ish glove and i kind of expected a ton of value from from that so with him being like probably you know 300 batting average for like his career is probably an attainable uh, goal for him with just with how good he is at putting the ball in play and um, kind of just spraying the ball all over the fields. Um, but when you're not walking or homering that much, it makes this pill a lot easier for me to swallow. So I, I don't, I don't think it'll be, it'll hurt him much in the, in the long run. And here's the thing, Joe, he only needs like 2,900 more hits to get to 3000. So, I mean, he's on his way. Uh, Tyrone, I assume I basically rephrased a, a thing you said in the first half of our show, first place. I'm guessing you're, this is definitely uh, no dust off your shoulder that, uh, that you find uh, Nick Madrigal eminently replaceable. I, I think it's all things where like he, because he's not really a plus fielder like I think he's shown signs of it but just he hasn't it hasn't materialized he's not a great base runner so you kind of need the offense to be there and it's just without walks and hitting for power it's just he's gonna have to hit like 330 340 to really like be like an irreplaceable type you know player and I think so it's more just a question of can the Sox find someone who's like a two to three win player and I, and I would I hope they could but also I mean I know when the Sox let Avi Garcia goes like, that's a great decision. And yet they never were able to replace that production <laughs> exactly. for years. So like, you know, counting on them to, to find just an average player. I don't know if that's a, a guarantee, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't see a scenario where you look back and like, Oh my God, if only we had Nick Madrigal and his singles. Well, it's tough too. Cause nobody's going to be like, Oh man, I hate Nick Madrigal. He's such a unique player. It's, it's really cool. I mean, he's, he is like an 1890s player. It's ridiculous. I imagine that's not a guy we should celebrate in uh, 2021, but he's a unique guy. And I mean, he's going to be around. I mean, I've always like linked him to Scott Fletcher. And I think if he could be Scott Fletcher, it'd be great. He'd have a great career if he could be Scott Fletcher. And I could see a lot of shirts in, in Wrigleyville. <laughs> oh God. Yes. They got their guy. <laughs> Um, but again, I think the overriding thing here too had to be not that you can blame him for it. It had to be injury. I mean, the fact that we're seeing significant chunks of the season being lost to this guy, freak injuries or not. And I, you could argue that the slide really was a little bit more directed by him and his fault and running out to first base, you know, isn't, but you don't want a guy you feel you're going to count on. And then you're stuck with Leo Garcia and Danny Mendick to try to patch your way to the playoffs. Not when you're not when the window is open, you, you, you can't do that. You do need to be, be able to rely on him and those cheap building could control him for several more years. Uh, I could see, I could see the jettison, especially having already brought in uh, Hernandez, who I, who I think again, after reading Zach Hayes' piece, as I mentioned yesterday in the podcast, uh, it got me a little more excited about having this guy uh, for, for the pop, uh, for the glove, for the fact that I think there's a lot of ceiling left in this season for him that we have, have not seen. Of course, I'm just preparing myself or I'm, I'm psyching myself out. I'm going to be crushed when he uh, doesn't do very well. Uh, the rest of the year, but uh, I think he's poised for that. So um, the pitching staff is stronger than ever. Uh, and that doesn't even include Dylan, a guy like Dylan Cease likely moving into perhaps the bullpen for the playoffs, which is like another reliever added. Uh, is this about as strong as you could have ever hoped the White Sox pitching staff bullpen and rotation to be? I mean, this for me is well beyond anything I could have hoped for going into this season. Yeah, I our mean, work, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Crystal. Oh, I was just going to say, if our worst right now is Dallas Keuchel and our bullpen is now absolutely stacked, then I'm good. <laughs> I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what I was going to say, too. 
uh, like heading into the season, if I thought I would go, um, well, I guess heading into the season, I wasn't uh, as big a fan as Craig Kimbrell, but if I knew he was going to have a 0.5 ERA right. by July, I would have been like, wow, all right. So Hendricks, Kimbrell, uh, and then Kopech in his like fireman, maybe he's a starter, maybe he's not role or Dylan Cease, wherever that fits in with Ryan Tapera. Like that's a, uh, that's fantastic. If now, if the lefties can just be how they're supposed to be, then this mm-hmm. bullpen, I, I can't really, I mean, it's going to be like those can't that Kansas city Royal bullpen where you just can't score on them. Where if you have a lead, then that's kind of it. Sorry. Mm-hmm. They, they won. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like Aaron bummer. I mean, if he can, if he can get and I don't think he's far from getting back there. Uh, uh, crochet. I mean, one or the other is going to make it pretty much locked down both. Do you even need starters anymore? Uh, this is sort of nuts. Uh, and I, as you can tell, I'm stammering. I had, I had to turn to the drink just to deal with this, uh, this Christmas in July, because we're not used to this. I'm an, I'm an older fan than the rest of you and I'm not used to this. Uh, so it's sort of delightful. Um, what is the playoff rotation right now? Who are the guys? Is it a three man? Is it a four man? And, and who gets, who gets left off? going into the postseason again, assuming health, assuming a play, them pitching about what they've pitched this year. So I think it's pretty, I think everyone would agree that Keiko is not a part of any rotation at this point. Um, and then it gets down to, like, I'm really, I'm expecting Kopek to start starting. Um, now, whether that's because they want him to be a starter next season or if they want him to start in the playoffs, I'm not sure, but it's definitely... Uh, if we're talking division series, since that's probably what the first one's going to be, uh, it, uh, it's got to be Lynn, Giolito, Rodon. Um, I don't know if in that order or not, but then then you kind of figure that out after. Like, do you? Re- I don't think in a five game series you need a four man rotation, but then if they advance to the championship series, then maybe Cease is needed. But that's a long way to think about now. And I'm just worried predicting that they're going to win a division series. So I'm, I'm going to keep it at that. Crystal was talking like a White Sox fan. Now Darren's stepping up like a White Sox fan. All right. That's fair. You know, not trying to jinx anything. By the way, there are no jinxes, but not trying to jinx anything. Just, you know, this is fodder. We're, you know, I don't we're, know we're if there's high. no jinxes. I don't know. I don't know. You guys are sounding like hockey fans now. All right, somebody else talk then. <laughs> My goodness, what am I losing you guys for? Come on. Uh, okay, all right. Um, then let's stop talking about the playoffs because they might not make the playoffs. Even if the rest of the division is AAA at best, they might not make it. Uh, all right, well, is there someone you really want to see? Crystal's already identified. Who's the person you really want to see on the White Sox that didn't end up on the team. Uh, Chris Bryant, I think, is a popular uh, favorite, even though that bat was seen was, was rendered a little less necessary with Aloy, I guess, coming back and uh, Luis uh, on the verge. Uh, is there someone uh, still the rest of you who were sort of really interested in getting that maybe wasn't supplanted by something else the White Sox got? I feel like I kind of, I wanted some catcher. Like, I think I would have liked Jacob Stallings just because I feel like he's solid defensively and would have been if when Grindall comes back, like kind of the perfect backup. But I think I kind of am just tired of watching Zach Collins catch and I'm tired of watching Zavala hit. So I'm kind of just, that that's my, my only concern. Also, I don't trust Grindall's knees to like stay healthy. So I think that's, if I had to pick like one area where I kind of wish they had addressed, it would be catcher. Was it shocking? Let me just jump in because I like to keep jumping in. Uh, was it shocking that, um, you know, everybody's, <laughs> we're, in a, we're in an era, maybe it's always been this way, we're in an era where it's like everything is like the most max ever. I'm sure this Lollapalooza in Chicago is going to be like the most rocking ever. And of course, you know, the most most diseased ever. But, um, you know, uh, everybody's like, oh man, this is the, this was the craziest trade deadline ever. And I think there's some, uh, some, reason for that uh was it shocking that even right at the end it's like every single player who could have been traded really was traded like at the last second uh, rodriguez uh left uh, pittsburgh i mean the very few i think stallings was one of the few that it didn't it, aside from the teams who just slept through it like let's throw colorado out because apparently they just they punted they went on they went on retreat uh a ton of guys moved and, and even really really late and i don't think i was expecting even though we had already seen a lot of i think darren had mentioned in the early podcast a lot of activity early i didn't think it could be sustained and yet 
it was sustained. It's like teams were looking for more guys to get rid of, like, you know, the guys they still had a ton of control over. Hey, maybe we should ship them out because we're in rebuild mode. I am more surprised about Trevor's story. And then I saw he was scratched tonight and I was like, he's just going to go try to trade himself somewhere. But, <laughs> and then I felt bad because all of these Cubs fans were like sharing this video of Chris Bryant, like emotional with the phone. And I was like, he looks really happy. Like, I don't, I don't really think he's sad about leaving that dump. Sorry. That's he my crystal. Good. He looked really happy. Yeah. Like, I would be crying tears of joy if yeah, I he did that like token hug, like like well like like was that Ross? He was hugging. He was like, well, he's right in front of me. I gotta, I gotta hug him instead of just dash. But if he wasn't there, he'd be like, okay, I am out. Hi. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, I had a, a salient point that's gone because because um, I'm in the Virgin Islands right now. But uh, uh, again, any anyone else who seemed to not um, oh, uh, my point was, I, I think Colorado thinks that perhaps the trade deadline isn't, it's, I don't think it's over till tomorrow. They're thinking, well, it's the end of the month, right? They're thinking it's the 31st. I think that's what it is. So that's why Trevor Story got scratched. They're like, yeah, we found the deal. Uh, and then the other, you know, Cincinnati has to call him back and say, um, <laughs> we left you the last message at uh, 2.59. It's okay. I remember the first time I got high, like, it's just <laughs> what happens. Uh, Colorado, at least there's an excuse. Let's hope that is the excuse because, you know, the fan base is, they, if they're not all just buzzed too, uh, their fan base is going to be like, um, Colorado, what? You know, we're not catching any of the three, three teams uh, ahead of them. That's a rough division. We're pretty fortunate for being in the AL Central. I don't want to jinx anything. Sorry, Darren. I'll just I'll whisper. Hey, Darren. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just... I, I was at the beginning of this, I was really surprised that it was kind of everybody but relievers going and then Ryan mm. Tapera happened. And then I figured there'd be more because none of the relievers, especially the bigger ones had been moved like Kimbrel. Uh, so I just kind of assumed that that would happen because I was really surprised that all these guys were getting moved the day before. Um, but now they don't start playing until after the deadline. So maybe that's kind of like why, why wait at this point, but now it's just, like, I thought this one was the best one, and I don't know the reasoning behind it, um, but there were so many teams that were probably in it in June, and then because of whatever happens, like uh, Strasburg being lost with the Nationals, yeah. and they also lost Schwarber, and then the Cubs just went from what, leading the division by a healthy margin to, I don't know what their losing streak was. Was it like 13 or something? Yeah. It was something just... 11, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it was something like that's like that happens like once every decade like that's just what happened and that's how they got out and it was two really good teams with really good players and they were like we can't do this even though the nl east is probably pretty winnable and the central still probably winnable they just had so many holes i mean it was pretty much like the 16 white Sox. like yeah. they had so many holes but they had some really good players and they just decided to get rid of them um, not un unlike the Sox, where it was kind of a wave from 16, then the offseason 17, um, <laughs> the Cubs and Nationals were like, we don't care anymore. You can take them. And now they're playing each other. So <laughs> there's a healthy segment of the fan base that finds sites like ours and others um, too negative. So forgive me if I'm um, a little high on the fumes of what was a terrific trade deadline for Rick Hahn. And I think it is very um, important to give credit when credit's due and criticize when criticism is due. And believe me, the White Sox have done a ton in this calendar year to criticize. And it's certainly fair to credit Rick Hahn in the front office for what they've done. Uh, that said, and I made the joke and made it a few times and occasionally gotten a laugh about Rick Hahn being the only guy acting like this was actually a buyer's market. Uh, he pulled off some incredible deals. And before we uh, uh, bump and, and kill this podcast, is there anything, is there any other deal you've seen uh, across the majors that rivals what Han managed to get away with, with the Cubs? Not to the same degree, maybe Cleveland. That seemed like it was a little bit more of an even deal, but with the Cubs, anything else jump out? Like, why'd they do that? Rick Han hopes you don't say anything. He's listening right now. He's like, don't say anything. Darren, I know you want to say, don't say anything, Darren. I'm still waiting oh. on my gift basket from him, so I'm sorry. Well, 
and the job offers, you've already lined up for like three jobs. The bottle opener alone, I guess, isn't as much of an issue because um, Lucas seems to have like corrected himself. So hopefully he won't cut himself again, but they still have a need for you beyond just being mummified in the scout seats. <laughs> for the question, um, are, is this specifically for trades or can it be anything? You know, we've got three minutes still to fill, so it can be anything, Joe. Oh, okay. Um, I thought the, yeah, we were talking about catchers earlier, which I think even with Grandal's injury, we might be in better hands right now with Zavala and Collins yeah. somehow compared to, compared to the, like, 2016, like, Alex Avila and um, Dion Navarro um, platoon situation. That was just a very sloppy um, attempt at, at, filling Tyler Flowers spot that one came to mind pretty quickly yeah that was ugly it's good to, it's good to know that that is in the past it seems that's in the past and we can complain oh man Seppi Zavala he can't hit or Zach Collins he can't catch you know both can be true but with the rest of this team it's not 2016 there's a lot of other good guys on this team so you might be able to like skate by obviously the White Sox think they're going to be able to skate by and somehow uh, build a bridge to Yasmani Grandal returning and returning healthy. I think he's already, he's probably already jogging like five miles a day. The guy's a lunatic and I'm sure he's just bugging, bugging, bugging. Like, Come on, get me in, get me in, get me in. Uh, but yeah, if that's our biggest worry, again, you know, no jinxes. Okay. Uh, let's wind up this podcast with no jinxes before, before I jinx anything. Uh, thank you. Super Joseph and Crystal uh, repping uh, in Indianapolis and in our Indianapolis field office. Uh, Tyrone, thanks for hopping on again. Uh, you're good luck. Thank you. You're good luck. And uh, Darren, Darren, uh, see you later. Uh, start warming that thing up in the microwave that we talked about before. Put the casserole in. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody, for listening, reading, as always, uh, and, and riding with us through this trade deadline. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've got a lot of attention on site. Uh, we'll keep uh, delivering for you, hopefully delivering wins and wins and wins. Once Crystal gets back on recap, she's like going to Pittsburgh, seeing the best park in the, in the majors this weekend. But once she gets back and starts doing some uh, six-packing, the winning streak's going to continue because she's the good luck charm when it comes to the White Sox. So I have to go see my baby first, Andrew McCutcheon. All right. That's fair. Okay. Then I'll be back. All right. And, and she's going to be on things and the winning streak is going to begin. All right. Thanks everybody for listening. As always, we'll be back with more Southside Sox podcasts, I'm sure, sooner than you think or maybe even want. Take care, everybody.